Tonight's program will contrast Dakota and Ojibwe missions in the 1830s. The missions were established by the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, also known as ABCFM. Our speaker, Linda Bryan, will examine the ABCFM, the missions, local influential religious leaders, Jedediah Stevens and Samuel and Gideon Pond, and their relationship with Chief Cloudman, the Dakota people living in the area, and Indian agent Lawrence Tolliver. Linda will look at the mission at Lake Harriet and the lake named Calhoun in 1839 and renamed Bede Makaska in 2018. Linda Bryan taught language arts and social studies in North St. Paul, Oakdale Maplewood School System for many years. She has extensively researched the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, starting with one at Grand Rapids, Minnesota at Pokegama Lake, where her family's cabin is located. Lake Pokegama is within the 1837 Ojibwe Treaty boundary, which she will be discussing. Also, Linda is a volunteer fur trade reenactor with the La Compagnie Historical Society. The La Compagnie reenactors volunteer at local historical events. Please give a warm welcome to Linda Bryan. I, am I on? Okay. I'm going to make a correction to what she just wrote. Pokegama Lake that I'm working with is a lot closer to us here. And in fact, if you had a war party, you would be up there a lot faster than going up to Grand Rapids because Pokegama that I'm talking about is at Pine City, roughly 70 miles north of my house. And so uh, you will hear about Pokegama a little bit tonight. I also want to say that at first I had thought that maybe I would come in costume for this event, and I was wearing a hoop skirt all this last weekend, and I'm done with that for a while. Uh, should you need a good event right around the time of 9-11 next year, come down to the Leduc House in Hastings, where there is a wonderful Civil War weekend. And uh, in the past, I've been the temperance lady. This year, I have been looking at the benevolences that worked with the freedmen after the war. And it ties in with work that I've been doing on a set of missionaries in the uh, American Board group. Their last name was Ayer, and I could bend your ear for another three days on them. Um, today we're on land that was occupied by the Dakota until 1853. They removed them to a reservation on the Minnesota River. I am choosing to use these terms, Indian and mixed blood. I will say Dakota instead of Sioux, and I will say Ojibwa instead of Chippewa or Anishinaabe, but I, I think you understand where I'm coming from here. We have to choose our words. Um, missions under discussion today were Protestant Christian, with donors from New England and New York and Ohio primarily, uh, with a strong Puritan flavor. They used the term pious. They were pious. And in part, that meant adhering to this standard. They have had a personal conversion experience, a rebirth into Christianity. If they qualify for church membership, this will become a very difficult point sometimes for a missionary because do New England standards apply or do Lake Harriet standards apply for some of this? Uh, no Sunday travel or work. No swearing, no gambling, probably no dancing, little or no alcohol consumption. Uh, they disapprove of customs that violate these standards. For example, uh, multiple marriages and lots of adultery, very shocking. Uh, mission staff were volunteers. They were unpaid, but the sponsor tried to provide food and housing, and they were allowed to hire help. Missionaries were volunteers. They did this as a benevolent service to mankind. My motive is to examine Minnesota history. I do not describe historic persons as winners and losers most of the time, 
but it's going to become clear to you that I dislike J.D. Stevens. And I like the Pond brothers and the Williamsons. If I say something confusing, please raise your hand, because others are probably confused as well, except that I shouldn't say that. I'll have to put my glasses on. Tell me, shout out, <laughs> explain. Um, on your timeline, please, if you have a pencil, make a good strong line below 1837 and the financial downturn there, uh, the treaties and the financial downturn, everything changed after that. And that's part of the reason why that wasn't a longer lived mission than it was. Okay, let's meet the ABCFM. It's called the board, or you can call it the ABCFM. It began in the 18 teens. Its home office was in Boston. There was an ocean harbor right nearby. It attempted even more new mission stations throughout the first third uh, half of the 19th century. The organization was a mix of Congregational, Presbyterian, and Dutch Reform donors and workers. Inland, I have to hit this one, or I should hit this, right? Okay. Inland missions, like this mission, corresponded with the correspond, uh, corresponding secretary, David Green, an incredibly wonderful man, who received the letters, digested the contents, reported this to the board, mostly pastors, and then wrote back to the missions. The problem was that the correspondence was slow and often not timely. He often said, I suppose you have this problem solved by now, but here's what we think. Foreign missions meant sea travel, worldly adventure, learning known foreign languages. At missions in Burma, China, Sandwich Islands, India, Middle East, and more, they brought you the mumu in Hawaii. Native American missions lacked that glamour of distant places. They relied on inland transport. How glam is it to take the Erie Canal? and required obscure languages understood by very few whites and not yet rendered into writing. Their Indian missions include the Creek, Cherokee, Chickasaw. And at this time, these tribes are in the news because Jackson wanted to get them moved. And the American board had been down with those, those people for quite a while. The American board, is the one that sponsored the lawsuit against Jackson. They won it in the Supreme Court, and Jackson said, heck with that, they're moving anyhow. So the missionaries, I don't know that they move necessarily with the trail. I haven't read those papers, but they ended up in what you would call Indian territory. Another place is Mackinac Mission, uh, was started by, um, other missionaries, and it eventually evolved into one under this umbrella in 1826. Uh, some Minnesota mixed bloods attended this, such as the younger sons of the Faribos, and also William Warren, who was the historian of the Ojibwe people, if you know what I'm referring to here. Then they made an Ojibwe mission in 1830, was the test for it, and then they tried some other sites, including Pagama. The Dakota mission began in 1835. The ponds were here in 34, but they weren't ABCFM at that time. They also had the Oregon Nez Perce in 36, and this is that Whitman mission that some of you may know was attacked by Indians, uh, a massacre, very sobering events. I'm going to be talking about what is the nature of this area. We are in Indian country, and you are not supposed to be here. You are banned unless you are in the Indian agency or the military and you are serving here, then you can be here. Um, 
Fur traders get a license and they have to, when they get their license, they pay a bond, but they also list out who is working for them. And all those names then are allowed into the exception department. Also ex accepted are essentially passport holders. Guys who get a pass from the Indian agent, who in this area is Lawrence Tolliver at Fort Snelling. Occasional tra travelers must check in and are under observation. So for example, if you came up on a steamboat excursion, you probably didn't have to go through the whole paperwork thing, but you better get back on that steamboat and leave. White spouses seem to be tolerated. For example, Philander Prescott. Um, Prescott has various jobs around here that fall under these other categories, but he's not consistently in those. Uh, he's married also to a native woman, or part native woman, and uh, that maybe fa factors into this. Uh, issues regarding appropriating land. In Minnesota in 1834, Indians own the land, the animals, and the waterways. They are not yours. The board did not own the land under its Minnesota missions. Before sending missionaries, the board sent exploring teams to verify interest. And J.D. Stevens and a man named Alvin Cole were here in 29 and spent the winter up on the St. Croix. And then they returned and reported what they had found here. And they had touched bases with as many officials as they could find home at the time. Advisors at Mackinac, Indian agents, Schoolcraft at Sault Ste. Marie, and Tolliver here, and the Indian agency itself gave input. Plus, in Ojibwa country, the American Fur Company, and I will call them AFCO sometimes, they kibitzed as well on the original mission launch, and the reason is they were the only way that this mission could have been launched and they actually donated tremendous services. But the American Fur Company, uh, toward the end of the 1830s, Henry Sibley, who was American Fur in this area, sent out a copy of a note to all the missions saying, guys, you're not gonna get services from us anymore. For example, we're not going to give you banking service as we have in the past. The commercial value of much of the American board labor in developing land was often lost when the government took the land to market. Sometimes the board was able to sell a property to a speculator who hoped to preempt the land. And I won't go into this, but if you want to know about preemption, I can tell you about it. In Indian country, how do you keep it going? A great deal of thinking was required for the board to create a mission. Money, lives, and its own reputation were at stake. But there was an urgency since Indian souls were at risk unless missions increased. One goal of the board was to counteract Indians' negative view of whites by creating an alternative to the unprincipled frontier types. The Indians had only met whites like these for the most part. Model pious white families that would counteract it. Missionaries required an ongoing communication with the board for mail, annual budgeting, and bill paying. I think we, okay, I'm still in the logistics. Uh, nothing could be done without the cooperation of the Indian agency. Agent Tolliver welcomed the ponds because he needed them for his agriculture project, and he had a humanitarian sentiment. Agent Schoolcraft welcomed the Ojibwa because he himself participated in an evangelical religious group, and then he also had a family that needed education. They had to bring their own clothing and household supplies. In time, additional clothing could be sent by sponsors annually, especially for growing children. There were no retail stores here, except that in Dakota, area here. Fort Snelling has a sutler who sells to the soldiers, and Sibley, 
of the American fur, ran a retail store in Mendota, mostly of Indian goods with dollar prices, but he might order you some things too. Supplies and food donations could be sent by home families or by the Boston office, but everything was so expensive and the time of receipt could not be known. Cash was generally not available to the missionaries. Bills were settled by the Boston office. In time, additional supplies were shipped in or made on site. Besides gardening, a mission would probably need plow farming, which implied laborers, tools, seeds, and draft animals. Although it was assumed the missionaries would learn Indian languages, they would have to start through interpreters. Working with interpreters was awkward and expensive. The missionaries themselves needed to invest the time to learn a language. There were obstacles. First of all, within small communal societies, the best way to keep people in line is mockery and sarcasm. And this was extremely, extremely difficult to overcome. Sometimes there's true menace. I have recently read in the um, materials that uh, I will cut off your clothes if you go to that church again. Well, that's a pretty good threat. Uh, medicine men opposed them because their whole status was wrapped up in this. You know, you're going to take them off their thrones. Conflicting ideas between native and Christian religions. For example, when you die, where do you go? Well, of course, the Dakota would tell you you're going south. There are conflicting folkways. For example, you know, is it okay to dance around a scalp with a drum? Or is it okay to tell people they cannot paddle or work on a Sunday? Dakota had a feud with the Ojibwa, and it's a major theme in this story today. They also had one of them, the Sac and Fox, and I'm not going to mention that again. There also is a code of manliness, and we will be talking about that. So I need now to tell you about the differences between the Ojibwa country and the Dakota country for the American board missions. Because you'd say, well, they're Minnesota missions. They're very different because of where they are positioned. The Ojibwa country is always oriented to Lake Superior, waterways and portages. Up there, you have slow communications, and the fur company has a monopoly. Now, they have a monopoly down here for the most part, but you have the fort here, and you have something called a steamboat, and that mitigates against that huge hold that the trader has on the Indian community. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie is extremely important to northern Minnesota. That's where the post office is. That's also where Henry Schoolcraft is. And there's a military base there, and then also down at Mackinac. There's a, a river called the St. Mary's, and the Sioux is at the top of it, and Mackinac is at the bottom of it. And you have to travel through that to get to Lake Superior. In the Ojibwa communities, they live in wigwams portable things that you can take apart and put together again. Uh, their world is very harsh, and you have to know it well in order to survive. It's called the seasonal round. If you start with summer fishing, you go to fall hunting. Uh, I don't have in here again, but we have more fishing and hunting in the winter and then you go to maple sugaring, and then you're back to the wild rice harvest, which I left out the first time I went around around here. Mo mobile populations, they are semi-nomadic, and they radiate in and out from a home base. Their whole family is gone for long periods. Their gardens tend themselves. They don't come back to pull weeds or chase predators. This map is going to show you where we are in the St. Louis River has a height of land and then you drop down the height of land and you get into a low area with swamps and then you're in a different drainage. You're in the Mississippi drainage and you take another small river and you're in Sandy Lake. Over on the Wisconsin side, you drop down from Lake Superior through the Brule River 
over in the Brule over there, you get to a portage that will get you down to the St. Croix. So if you don't have a handle on these two places in all seasons, you're not going anywhere. Um, I also have St. Croix Falls here. That will eventually become the post office. And then you can see Fort Snelling down at the bottom. Uh, I always used to tell my students that the Mississippi River is a, a question mark with a long stem on it. And the Minnesota River is a reverse check mark. And if you can kind of picture where these are here, it's hard to see. OK, we're going to see what's here. The first of the Ojibwe missions is at La Pointe on Madeline Island. The second one is at Sandy Lake. The third one comes the same time as the second. It's at Leech Lake. Then Fond du Lac replaces Sandy Lake. That's basically West Duluth. Uh, Yellow Lake is down where Danbury, Wisconsin is, east of the Hinkley Casino. Uh, Pokegama Lake, my Pokegama, is down here. And then in a cluster, we get later on Red Lake and then these green ones. Those are people from Oberlin for the American Missionary Association, which collaborated with Frederick Ayer on the Red Lake mission after Pokegama was attacked. And finally, we have Bad River here, and we have St. Joseph's up into uh, North Dakota. Those are later. 1840s and beyond. Missionary links with Prairie du Chien and St. Louis are one of the features for the Dakota who are in the Mississippi River drainage. And it's completely different from that Ojibwe portaging life. It is so easy to move around here. You just go on these two rivers, the Minnesota and the Mississippi. In fact, you have seasonal services by these steamboats. And old letters will say, well, it's until ice out or until ice in that we are going to time things. In the winter, they're closer to Ojibwe country in their needs. The Minnesota River is the conduit to the west and up to the British border where they have something called the Red River Colony. You would call it Winnipeg. Overland is available. You can take foot or horse. And there are a few of the Dakota communities that apparently are inland from these waterways. And if you want to go places, you might need to put on your shoes and get going. The biome is essentially prairie, although there's something called the big woods that follows the long part of the check mark of the Minnesota River. The Fort Snelling area was denuded along its riverbanks. Why? Who knows? That's where you get your firewood for the fort. In this area, it was a prairie. And you can have prairie fires. And the, the uh, ABCFM saw prairie fires out here, right here. So when you look out the window tonight, you better be careful. Uh, there may have even been buffalo. I don't hear a lot about it, but I'm good, right? Yeah. OK. Here are Dakota missions. We're going to do this same gig. And am I making bad noise? Oh, don't push it anymore. OK, we're going to start with Fort Snelling and Traverse de Sioux. Thank you. OK, here's Fort Snelling. And if you leave from Fort Snelling and you want to go to the bottom of the check mark, Traverse de Sioux is where Gustavus College is in St. Peter now. OK? And if you stopped at Traverse de Sioux, there would be an American Fur Company post there with Luby Provençal, who, by the way, can't read, but he is really good at picture drawings for all his goods in his record keeping. But if you got out of the boat there and started going across country, at least the water traffic would get you this far. Low water is one problem, and water access is another. I don't know who owned that watercraft or those watercraft, but they were bateau, probably. And that's a flat bottom boat that you would row and paddle. Uh, paddle fore and aft and row in the middle. And you'd sit right on the bales and boxes in it. Once you're down at Traverse de Sioux, you offload. 
And now is the overland trek either across that, that land area there or you start going up. The other way that you can go is simply to start at Lake Harriet and start walking. And you could walk to, out to Lackey Parle. So let's find out where that is. Lackey Parle is the Renville Trading Post. And just as the American fur was extremely important to the Ojibwa missions, without Renville, there would never have been this mission. They actually lived within his palisade and in his house for a very long time. Adding to that, we have some non-ABCFM people at Kaposha, that's South St. Paul, those are Methodists. And then down the river at Red Wing, we have Denton and Gavin, known as the Swiss Mission. Uh, those are both French-speaking Swiss, and they are, uh, one of them is married to a former teacher from Mackinac. Later on, uh, Kaposha will have an American board Williamson presence there. And then down at Wabashaw's village, that's the place where uh, J.D. Stevens will go before he leaves the Mississippi area. Um, later on, more, you have Oak Grove. Uh, down below the cliff is apparently where the mission is, down where the Indians can paddle to it. But uh, Samuel Pond puts his Gideon Pond puts his house on the top of the hill, and if you go there today, it's, a, it's worth visiting the Pond House in Bloomington. And then you'll notice that there is a mission at Traverse de Sioux, and that one is a lot easier to access because that can be boat every direction. And then later on, after the treaties, you begin to get even more missions, and these are close to the new Indian agencies. It has Indian agency gets moved from Fort Snelling elsewhere. And one last thing is that the Kaposha mission will move to across the river. I'm showing you this fast. You can't see it, but you can see it in general. This is the Pond Dakota site in Bloomington. This is part of their signage. And you can see how many Indian villages are here and how many missions and that kind of thing. A lot of this dates more toward the treaty period. The Dakota Ojibwe feud. Our wars with the Chippewas has been of so long standing that our oldest people can't tell when it commenced. That's what Tolliver wrote in his diary. He was quoting a Dakota who had visited him. It was brutal. The warfare was so indiscriminate, it didn't matter whether or not something had happened recently. If you saw an enemy, there was a chance that you just got the urge. And it could be women, it could be children, it could be large groups, it could be individuals. Runners would come saying, we found a body, or something's happened, someone had gone missing, and they, oh no, have. It was incredibly hard on people, wasteful, and sometimes large numbers of victims. Families could be decimated, and little villages, and all the Ojibwe village, villages were relatively small, could be decimated. It was a never-ending personal and community stress. The heirs whose papers I have been reading had a son who said in his old age, his memory of growing up with the Dakota kids was that uh, they had to be on their alert for the Dakota all the time. He grew up with Ojibwe kids. And it was constant tension, even for very small children. Be careful the Dakota may be in the woods. In 1835, the government got around to enforcing the boundary that had been set in 1826 at Prairie du Chien in a confab, and they sent surveyors, and they, sent, they set up pillars after surveying the line that the Indians had agreed to. And you know what? Those pillars got knocked over immediately. Missionaries alerted one another if intertribal violence seemed possible. Before 1835, the Ojibwa were supposed to gripe to Henry Schoolcraft. Now, imagine starting out at Leech Lake and going to see Mr. Schoolcraft and turning around and coming home again. That's a good paddle. In 1834, finally, after pleading, Tolliver had said, 
we need an Ojibwa agency here to keep the Ojibwa from coming down to see me. They're here all the time. And of course, there's a greater likelihood of bloodshed. They created the Crow Wing Sub Agency, and if you want to talk on that, I can give you one. It was awful. Ojib was still returning to Tolliver, but he had been scolded, and he wasn't supposed to work with those Ojibwa, but he did. There also was another new uh, sub agency, and that was so close by, that was at Madeline Island near Bayfield, if you know where I am there. Little government supervision or coordination of uh, Ojibwa affairs was being done. And eventually, we're, I'll be talking about 39 violence. It could have been stopped with better monitoring. OK, changing topics. Farming. Civilization, according to these whites, means plow farming. Row crops, hay, and that's why the hay fork, as well as a garden. Now, the government and the ABCFM want these Indians to learn plow farming. What does it take to make a farm? You fell trees, you root up the stumps, or you plow the prairie grasses. Then you better fence it, keep the deer out, prepare for spring planting or fall wheat planting, protect them from bird predation. Then you harvest it, but where do you put the crop if you were living in a log cabin? And then you manure the fields. And my question is, yeah, with what? OK, this is supposed to not show this. So I'm just going to, the farming model has two kinds of farmers involved. In the government side, they need an ag agent, someone who teaches farming but also helps produce a crop that is helpful to the Indians. Um, the, mission side, they also want to teach farming, but they have to have subsistence for themselves. So it all comes together. This is extremely important if you're talking missions. Who is the farmer? Is it the missionary, the guy with Rev in front of his name? Is it a volunteer who comes in from Boston and says, I would just love to grow corn at Lake Harriet? Is it a hired person? Who acquires and pays for the draft animals? Who feeds it? Who overwinters it? And where? Indians in the mission must retain some seed and potatoes for the next season. In a log cabin with three families in it, where do you put that? They need carpentry. They need farm tools. They need wagons, fence posts, rails, building supplies, time, experienced laborers, crop and equipment storage, planning, and draft animals. The problem is that the local hired help pool is notoriously small. They're inefficient. They have to be supervised constantly, so you can't write sermons. They're inexperienced. They're expensive. And they're used to fur trade bosses. No please and thank you here. Ponds had farm and carpentry talents. They had apprenticed in some of this. They did, but they didn't come here to farm. They came clearly with the idea that they were going to save Dakota souls, and the only way to do it was to start with language. And they were absolutely focused on that from day one. My daughters tell me my slides are horrible, and they are. I know that. I'm going to walk you through this, because I need you to think about the ages involved here. The ponds are in their 20s. They're unmarried aging young men. J.D. Stevens is 39, but his wife is 30, close to the age of the ponds. Stevens has children, and he has a foster daughter, and I won't go into this tonight unless someone asks later, who's with him. And then he also has a niece who is 16 and was included only because he begged the board to include her and promised to feed her. And she had been a Sunday school teacher back in New York. Then there's Rollo Brown. I, don't, I just want to mention him. Uh, Stevens hired him when he was on a jaunt to Oberlin because he knew that he needed laborers that were good. And he never got the authorization of the board. And when Rollo Brown married and showed up here, the board said, no. 
Peter Garyich had come down with a group from Red River and was here short term, and he was hireable for a while. And he left a diary, which has been helpful for me. Then there's Sabrina. This is J.D. Stevens' older sister. And she's at the Pokegama Mission. And she's included in the mission list there. She primarily does domestic work. So I think she tends babies and washes dishes and keeps the house. But it turns out she's down here. I don't know how much. I do know this, that Fred Eyre very diplomatically said in a letter to uh, David Green, you know Sabrina doesn't do much. Dr. Williamson came up with his family from Ohio. He was a medical doctor as well as ordained. And he was 37, closer to Stevens in age, and his wife, I don't, oh, she's 34, and they have some children, and they come with their friends from Ohio, the, the Hugginses, and they have children, so they are, I don't know how old. Stephen Riggs comes later, and he is 27, roughly in the same age realm as the Ponds, and I don't know how uh, old his wife is, and they have two children in in 37, they've got two children here. There are two stations, as you know. The staffing is Stevenson's, Stevens at Lake Harriet. Williamson's, Huggins, Riggs's, Lackley Parle. Ponds, here, here, here. When transportation allows, and they can arrange it. And the reason, in part, is they have skills that are needed. Gideon had apprenticed as a carpenter. And I have read some of his diary recently. It's at the Hennepin County Historical Society. And for days, he's planing boards, and he's working on this. And then two weeks later, he's creating doors or partitions or something else. He worked there for months making a building. Um, he did the same thing up here. In 1837, we have the two treaties, and the most important thing for now is for you to be aware that white settlement is allowed on the east side of the Mississippi after that. So that means right across from the fort, and that means pig's eye parent in the booze. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all of this. I've given you enough on the ordinations. The big problem is who has bragging rights and pecking order topness? And that's a problem. Given who you are, this map on the right is probably not useful. But if anybody needs to know where Lake Harriet and Lake Calhoun really are, they're here. I will use the term Lake, uh, Lake Calhoun most of the time. It's what my notes say. Um, let's get that out of here. And on the left, you see a very different map of the same place. This map was made in 1834 when the ponds had finally got themselves up and running at Lake Calhoun. The two blue rectangles, do they so? Okay, they look blue. You know the top one, and you know the bottom one. You may not know those trails in between, and for many of you, you can say, where is my house on this map? Um, we're going to look next at where the government sawmill is because you need to see this in relationship to this sawmill at St. Anthony Falls. Over here, this, I, my arrow's a little too long, that's the Indian burying place, but closer to the lake, I believe, is where the agricultural project that Tolliver was running is. Down here, this is the Cloudman Village. Believe it or not, those little things are uh, teepees. And then this is the original pond house in the fall of 34. And later, that was called the Pavilion Hotel. So the house must have been taken down or something happened to it later on in the 19th century. Now, I want you to ask yourself, how do you go from here down to Fort Snelling and figure it out? On Little Lake Harriet there, the Lake Harriet mission will be there, and I'll show you better than my arrow shows you later. Here's where Sibley's store is, and you have to ferry across the Minnesota River to go over there. 
So if your wife says, as you go shopping down in the fort area, leaving from Lake Harriet, you know, be back soon, honey. You can guess how soon is soon. OK, Tolliver's farming experiment. It's called Eatonville or Pondville. Eden was the Secretary of War under Andrew Jackson. And Calhoun was the Secretary of War under previous president. So we're buttering up the Indian Agency and the War Department here, because the Indian Agency is part of the War Department at this time. In 1828, he began the experiment with two Dakota families at Lake Calhoun. And he got hold of oxen and a plow. Excuse me, he is Tolliver in this, but the agreement was that these could be Cloud Man people. Cloud Man had had a bad experience. He and his hunting party were out on the prairies, and a blizzard came up. And they nearly died. And he told himself, this is not a good plan. I need a plan B. And he began to consider the idea of more subsistence in uh, farming. Now, we've talked about, uh, oh, there's something called a farmer house later on in the ponds. Uh, sphere, and I don't quite understand it all. The ponds, when they came, right away, Tolliver meets them, and he finds out they know how to farm. And the first thing is, can I have you plow? And so one plows down at Kaposha, and one plows up here. And in exchange for that, they get favors. Among them, I believe, are some boards from the Fort Snelling uh, of sawmill. The government has roughly $500 in the early years, and this is wrong, it should say 600 for the later years. This is the map that Tolliver sent to the Indian Agency in 1835. And it's awful, but I have a digital copy of it. And if you would like to see it on my computer later on this evening, you can see it blown up. And it's readable. Now, move. This is the problem. The government needs a hired farmer. <laughs> Where are you going to get him? Where is this farmer going to fall from? This is a blow up of that little thing on that blurry map. And this is the Lake Harriet mission at the top up there. This is fantasy in 1835. He probably drew that in after Stephen said, oh, I'm going to make a mission there. So it's this big already, big as a lake. And over on the other side, you get to see this is Calhoun. Look very hard. You know these streets. You know this area. And there's more. There's another version of this map someplace, and I don't know where it is, but I found this online. It deals with the renaming hassle that went on in the last few years, and I flipped it over so you could read it. Someone has written on this, that, and you notice that this set of farm fields is different. And so that one has to be an earlier map than this one. So this was going on a long time. Tolliver favors the Lake Calhoun band. He gives them money for their surplus corn. He takes the barrels that are out back and doesn't burn them. He gives them to the Indians, probably for corn storage. And he also has animals and tools. 1840, we now have farmers paid through the Indian agency by treaty money. And here you can find, if you can look carefully, some of you might be able to see um, the name of Mr. Pond down here. Where is he? He's near the top. Yep, you see the word farmer over there probably. And so this is all government now. He's slopping on the government trough, as my dad used to say. This is Seth Eastman's guarding the cornfields. It's at the Minneapolis Institute, and it says on the website, not being shown currently. But this is 
surely done right here in your neighborhood. Notice there's a teepee here, but this is a good sized project. And what these women are doing is scaring away the crows as they come down at, when the corn is ripening. They scream and holler and make as much noise as they can. Uh, the ponds remember this in their old age and write about it in a memoir. Okay, you're gonna build a log house or are you gonna build a lumber house? The nearest civilian sawmill is at Chippewa Falls and it's illegal. Tolliver had given permission for it and then the rules were changed and he was really supposed to shut it down. There is another sawmill, of course, at St. Anthony Falls, but you have a third option if you need boards and that's called a pit saw. I'm not gonna go into pit saws much right now, but just know that it takes two guys, a scaffolding, and you put the log up on the scaffolding, and it takes a very long saw. One man at the top and one at the bottom, and guess which one is more fun. Um, log houses, whether you're gonna put logs in the pit saw or build them into a house, you have to be able to haul them. You don't pick up a log and bring it home. Uh, Laborers are needed to square it with an ad, so you have square sides if you want a really nice house. And then you need ropes and scaffolding, and you have to be able to lift it. And if you're going to put something between the logs, I recommend deer uh, hair, because it's like little balloons. There's a bit of air in there, and it, it'll fill those spaces, even if it's crushed. And you have to drop the logs, or if you're making a Lincoln log house, you have to make the corners be different. Uh, the drop the logs and put them in a, a basically a long gully board, uh, log on the corners. That's a French Canadian style. The floors are half logs. You can make partitions. I don't know how you're gonna make them without boards, but you can do it. And you have to have a stair to get up there. The roofs are, poles up there, and then you put slab wood if, you, the, if the mills are giving away the, the barky ends of the sawn wood, or um, you can put bark up there, and elm trees shed bark when they die, and those slabs of bark are very useful to the Dakota too. Stoves, well, if you brought one. Otherwise, you could maybe order one through Mr. Sibley or the sutler. Otherwise, you make a fireplace, and Gideon Pond, literally out at Lacquey Parle, brought a massive flat stone into the cabin that he was making in order for that to be a safe place for the stove. On the outside, a clapboard is those up, up and down boards that you nail on the outside, and the problem with clapboards is they're boards, and they keep the leaks out. This is, this is the St. Anthony Falls sawmill in 1835, according to Tolliver. You can see that the uh, river, the Mississippi River with the falls of St. Anthony are very nicely rendered. And then we have two buildings there and then two over farther. And I suspect one is a kitchen building and one is probably a barracks. Whoops. Yeah, that's what I want. This picture I found at the Hennepin County Historical Society and you can figure out that we're looking in the front area here at, I think that, that um, masonry building is that taller one in that other picture. Even in 1835, this was in such bad shape that when Stevens said, could we use the sawmill please, that he was turned down. The request had to go to Washington and get authorized, but the other thing was that it was in such tough shape that there had to be a detail of soldiers up there monitoring and keeping it safe while things were going on. This is Lake Calhoun. The pond cabin was on the crest of that hill to the right. This is from the book, uh, Two Volunteer Missionaries. Few civilian workers in unseated West, so who's going to help? As we said, the uh, French Canadians, maybe, short-term persons, Indians, or husbands of these. The big thing is how expensive they are. And in the letters to the board, they're saying, you have no idea what we have to pay for help here, and it's lousy help. And if you take this $15 to $25 a month, 
multiply it out 12 months, and uh, have it for a couple of guys, you have roughly the amount of money that would keep a small mission going without hiring any help. Few civilian workers, he did that. Stevens decided against siting the mission at Lake Calhoun, and his excuse was there's more timber at Lake Harriet. Now, that may be a good excuse. I don't know if it really is. There was timber on the pond map. But I also, this is me speaking, I think it gave him a separation from Tolliver and the ponds. If they're going to be up there on that hill and back in that area up on Lake Calhoun, I'm going over to Harriet. I'm going to be the chief over there, and they can follow me. The mission schools required interpreters, both at Lake Harriet and out at Lac Parle. They needed school materials. What do you use in a classroom when you have people that are living in teepees? Mission women did most of this work. Who are the mission women? It's his wife and his niece. Schools in, oh, and in the Renville area, everybody joins in in working on that school. School in mission household is that standard until you get a schoolhouse. Now, when you first saw uh, that first picture, that's the Lacqui Paro mission that I had up here when we started. I believe that wasn't made until much later, perhaps when the place was reoccupied. Making that church was not practical as a beginning activity. It's just too much labor. These schools have lots of students enrolled, but roughly only a fifth are attending most of the time, at most. These reports are sent to the Indian Agency once schools become a part of the treaty paid services to the Indians. So the board is doing part of the expense, but the federal government now is helping pick up a part of it. The problem is, that the Indians believe this is embezzlement. And it just makes them more angry at the mission. If you look carefully, uh, this one, well, we're just going to leave it at that. This is enrollment stuff. And it is out at Lac Uh After, yeah, this is this embezzlement thing. This is not known by most historians. When almost within the first months of occupation of the Lake Harriet site, Stevens is approached by Henry Sibley, who is the big man of the American fur in Mendota. Sibley is the guardian of a mixed blood girl, maybe more than one. And he is supposed to use settlement money from a different treaty to educate her. Where are you going to send her? Well, Stevens could do it. And Sibley is willing to pay, and others are willing to pay. And before you know it, we have this little group of, I think, all girls who are living in the Stevens household and are being exposed to English. How much actual teaching is going on, I don't know. We're talking about people who were in New York not too long ago. Um, Peter Garriash, who is doing work in the new building that is being built for um, the Stevenses in the next year, is finishing the house. And these kids are underfoot everywhere. Their idea of sport is taunting white people. And they have a blast. And he records what they do during church services. And he's just shocked. This I'm calling the elementary school mafia. One of these students is Cloud Man, or we're going to say this, Linda, you can do it, Mapia Wikaska. Am I right? Uh, that's Cloud Man. He's the chief who is involved with the agricultural project. The father of his grandchild is Tolliver himself. And so Tolliver is one of the people paying the tuition and board bill. 
Stevens uses this money to give himself more latitude. It augments the money he's got. The niece and Steven's foster daughter learn the Dakota language from these girls. And so then they are able to keep Stevens moving forward. I don't know how much interpreting they can do, but apparently they can teach school. So here's Lake Harriet with his wife, niece, and kids. The boarding school and a school for Dakota kids, a few of them, within their home until they have some other place to go. They're giving church services locally, but the big thing is to commute to Fort Snelling and give a service down there. He's hiring workers, and they're being paid from the American board. Peter Garriach and then Rollo Brown was supposed to be paid, but that got put down. And then Gideon Pond gets hired. And he's supposed to do this and supposed to do this. And uh, he, he essentially gets pushed around, I think. And that question of, am I being paid or am I volunteering here? It, it gets very, very, very odd. This is over by where your trolley tracks are at Lake Harriet. And it says on here, this is the first school, schoolhouse in Minnesota, June 1835. Well, I tell you, that schoolhouse went up in a hurry because Stevens arrived just weeks before. So yes, there was a school perhaps, but it was probably in one of those buildings over close to, to Fort Snelling. Lackley Powell Mission, they're, as I said, living with the trader. Samuel and Gideon each help separately. The fur trader is a willing partner most of the time. Every so often, he kind of gets moody or difficult. And it has to do either with Indian politics or fur trade politics. And we've talked about the logistical issues. Uh, agriculture is happening out there much better than it's happening here. They have a really good school project. And they are doing Sunday services. And they are trying to preach in Dakota, even if it's just little stuff but they're trying it out. And it's clear that the mixed bloods and some native people are appreciating this effort. Williamson out in uh, Lackley Parle is the superintendent. However, when he sends a letter to Boston and the answer comes back, Stevens could have sent two or three because he's the one that has the mail right down there at Fort Snelling and the steamboat service. The visits between the places have to be coordinated, and this distance adds to the operating cost of that distant mission. The Pond brothers are a team, but they're separated. And I want you to think about the emotions that are involved. These are guys who have sacrificed everything, leaving Washington, Connecticut for this place. And now they're working with this. Creative interactions and new living arrangements advance the language program. All the difficulties make it even better for these language learners to practice their Dakota. Um, there is supposed to be a group meeting every so often at Mendota. And the guys out in Lackley Parle do their best to have at least one person having a meeting. But you never see Stevens going to Lackley Parle, ever. The language project, you dive in and speak the language, collaborate with, co with colleagues. The Pons began their word book immediately. And the fort had an ongoing word book project. What it was, I can't tell you exactly. But they started this. And then Williamson joins in with Renville and a French Bible. And I have to explain this. Renville doesn't speak English. Williamson is trying to learn French, and Renville's trying to learn English, and they're housemates. And Williamson, I am guessing, brings his English Bible, and he's got the verse for this Sunday service there. And he and, and Renville figure out where this is in the French Bible. And then Williamson says some things that he has in his Bible, and Renville listens, and he kind of gets the idea of how the English sounds for these ideas. They're theological things. They're hard. And then the French Bible gets read aloud. And then I can just imagine Renville looking at the ceiling and saying it in Dakota, 
while Williamson grabs, grabs pencil and paper and is doing his best to render this. And then he says it, and the other man says it, and they practice it. Then it ends up in the pond word lists. And slowly, this keeps going on. Williamson with his growing list of Bible verses and that kind of thing. And the Pons with their growing list of dictionary things. Pons and Williams share insights in vocabulary lists and they begin to psych out the nature of the sounds. And they work up an alphabet because some of the sounds aren't English. And they work up the vocabulary lists and then Riggs comes, and now they have to show him, and they become teachers, and they're forced to go back through it all over again, and Riggs is listening, and they give themselves tasks. Today, when I'm in the field, I'm going to ask a man about his shoes, and then they work on that. Or today, I'm making this up, but you know what I mean. This is what I found at the Hennepin County Historical Society in Gideon Pond's diary. At the back of the book, he is writing down random seeming words, but they must be words that are showing up in the daily activities that he experienced during the day when he was writing his diary material. The result, this is our first book. Williamson publishes it at Ripley in his hometown in 1835. So that soon in the project, they've already made one. Later on, they say, oh, God, the mistake's in there. But they tried. At the bottom, I believe that's the Lord's Prayer. Eventually, the mission produced a dictionary, more teaching materials, hymns, a newspaper, and a Bible. And later on, much later, they do some translating. The boarding school plans fizzled, and I'm just going to let this go. It, there's a push for boarding schools, and the board has closed the Mackinac Mission boarding school, and they're never going there again. No mission boarding schools. Okay, 1839. We're on your, on your timelines. We're below that line now. There's a mess, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but for reasons that made sense at the time, there's... Malax and farther north, Ojibwa, end up down at Fort Snelling at a time when Tolliver is absent. So the person who could have defused things easiest is gone. And the other ones didn't realize what was going on until too late, other people that could have been here. And the result is that when the Ojibwa left, they went two directions. One group went up the St. Croix, and one went up the Rum River. And at both Battle Hollow in St. Croix and up on the Rum, there was an attack by Dakota from down on the Minnesota River. And the Dakota were extremely successful in general. And so, depending upon who I'm reading, there are between 100 and 150 dead. the greatest Indian massacre of the time that I am looking at in the upper Midwest. It is huge, and it makes almost no news within the Indian agency. I'm still searching for information about this there. However, the newspapers get it. Steamboats now come up to Battle Hollow to pick up souvenirs. Tourism. In the missions, both up at Pine City and down here at Lake Harriet, these missionaries are absolutely demoralized. They have been teaching, turn the other cheek. War is not the way. You must be kind to your brother, even if he is not kind to you. And it's all undone. Additionally, the Crow Wing Sub Agency, which was non-functional and not doing anything, the government just wrote it off. It never did build a building. It never did get a permanent staff that would stay and it's gone. So now the uh, Minnesota Ojibwa are forced because Tolliver is no longer available to them. The, the Indian Department said that also. They have to go to Madeline Island for all of their gripes. So everything is getting worse. Cloud Man sees a target in his mind painted on all those teepees at Lake Harriet. The Ojibwa are not going to stand for this. They're coming for him. And so he ends up down on the Minnesota River. 
Tolliver then quits. This man who has been in the agency longer than almost any Indian agent I have studied is gone. He has institutional memory that goes back to the start of Fort Snelling. He knows the chiefs, he knows everything, and he is gone. The commandant at the fort has to take over for him for a while, and then we get a new man named Amos Bruce. What takes down everything? I'm just going to say this. It's liquor and the annuity payments that are the new discouragers here. Liquor inundates the Indian West after the two treaties are signed in 37. And when Indians get an installment every year of money and goods, especially when they haven't experienced it before, they think that Santa Claus is coming. And they don't see the point of starting a garden and doing ag work. So then what's facing them is starvation, especially if the buggy doesn't arrive with all the stuff. With all of that, the configuration has changed. At the Renville site, they've already had problems out there, and that ends. Stevens leaves the American board and becomes the Indian farmer for the government down at Winona, where Wabasha has his band. Um, Hopkins family, Petty Johns, and Jane Williamson will come in time in the 1840s. The ponds are here in this area at the Baker House, and the Hugginses are there with them. Gideon then, as I said, goes to Oak Grove. Samuel goes to Shakopee, and it's called Prairieville. And the problem is Shakopee himself is not a very uh, obliging guy, and I'm surprised he's there. But he had reasons to go. The Pons will marry and then experience their own family lives. Riggs goes to Traverse to Sioux with Huggins in 1843. And then in the 1851 treaty, I've told you that uh, some of these people go to that western end of the Minnesota River again. So here's the same picture you've seen before, but they will probably have more meaning for you now. And I'm just going to leave that for a moment before we start to sew this all up. Any questions on the map? Anybody? Is there a hand up? OK. Thank you for listening. I'd like to introduce you to some friends before we completely end. These are your new friends. On the left is Samuel, and on the right is Gideon. They look like brothers. This is Mrs. Stevens. She goes from Rabashaw's village down at Winona, or yeah, at Winona. She and he end up over at Prairie du Chien on the other side of the river working with whites. And while she's there, she apparently gets direly ill. And she's dead very shortly after that. He will remarry and have more kids. She had left something that I just have to read. I haven't resolved no more to look for good or happiness on earth. I have met with disappointment after disappointment. Here is her loved one. I love looking at him. It's like, how would you like to meet him at the breakfast table? <laughs> this is Dr. Williamson. I don't have a picture of his wife. These are the Riggses, the young college kids. And the rest of this is history. We're done. Say that again. Well, the Stevens that you talk about, is that the Stevens house? That no, and that's an excellent question. This is S-T-E-V-E-N-S, Jeremiah Dwight, so J.D. Stevens. And he's a reverend twice. He went out and convinced two different congregations to ordain him. He's got double rev in front of his name. And then, uh, I thought I heard that Gideon had like 16 children. Well, the deal is this, at, he, his wife died when he had some children, and at the Traverse de Sioux treaty negotiations, I'm supposed to be in front of this, aren't I? 
uh, at the Traverse de Sioux treaty negotiations, Mr. Huggins died. He went out to take a bath in the river and he never came back and they found his body. And that family then went down into uh, what they call the United States in the letters. And she stayed with relatives for a while, but Gideon went and found her. And they, they had a blended family that was large. Yes, and that house that he built had all those kids in it. Someone said to me, that's how he was able to make all those bricks. They had a big <laughs> brick making project there. Someone else, more questions, please. So John C. Calhoun was um, Secretary of War under uh, uh, Monroe, right? And then Quincy Adams was president, and then he was VP under Jackson. When was he involved with displacing the Indians? I mean, the ones that, that the three C tribes that you showed up there, I assume were the ones that he was notorious for. Um, so was that when he was Secretary of War, or? Well, I, it's the Edenville project was, was the result of interactions with the War Department. And I assume, I don't know who named it Lake Calhoun, whether it was Tolliver or somebody else. But that's before the period that I've looked into. And I can't really give you the reasons there. Calhoun eventually is in the, is it in the Senate? And he's the one, if you watch, is it the Amistad movie? And he's just belligerent. He, he's a big Southern rights man, and, that, and he's a big slaveholder. I believe that, I believe that uh, Eaton was the Secretary of War under Quincy Adams. He was. OK. All right. Well, and the big thing is there's a scandal in Washington dealing with Eaton's wife, and I'm not going to even touch that. You want to follow that one? Wikipedia is much better than I am. Okay, um, that figure that you came up with um, about the cost of running a mission back in around uh, the period from 1834 to uh, 1839, um, it's 550. In today's money, it'd be about 16,000 or so. Oh, if you took 500 as a yeah, I guess that's interesting. And all of that is donation money, sometimes coming in literally in pennies to Boston. And they have people that go from village, thank you, village to village. And they arrange with the pastor to be able to have a mission Sunday and talk to a congregation. And then they pass the hat. Um, I've read the papers of the people in the American Missionary Association who are doing this kind of fundraising. And it was laborious work to get the money out of the donors to get it in there. And then in 1837, when the, the financial market falls apart, of course, what's going to happen to the donations? They plummet. And all this investment has been made, and these missionaries are used to whatever they have for their, is that me? For whatever they have for their, um, uh, usual budget, and they've already been kind of mentally planning on it, and something called the circular is sent around from Boston. And it's a, it's a printed piece of paper with new rules. Everybody, don't plan on spending anything. Your mission has, and there's a blank, been, uh, it's been decided that this much will be deducted from your usual site. Stipend, get used to this idea that you're only going to get this. And please uh, be as frugal as possible with everything. And from then on, in 1842, I've read a lot of fur trade papers, and the fur trade is in such trouble. That's when the American fur begins to get in real trouble, a mess. And they close the Mackinac um, warehouse, and they put it at, at La Pointe, and they, they sell the Dakota area of the um, trade to a guy in, in St. Louis, and they're, they're shrinking like crazy in order to try to make it all work. Anyone else with questions? Yeah. Um, just to, you may have said this, but uh, where was the Jebediah Stevens house and uh, a school on Lake Harriet? 
The Stevens House and School are on the sort of the northwest corner, I believe, of Lake Harriet, where that fantasy set of buildings was. Okay, so near the but that schoolhouse is the 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 plaque the plaque for what they call the schoolhouse may have been that house. Yeah, we've been doing some research on that. Peter Sussman has uh, found some evidence that the uh, actual house and mission may have been at the top of the hill where Linden Hills Boulevard meets Queen. Um, and he's, he's got some, yeah, he's got some, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, newspaper and some uh, accounts. Thank that, you. That the uh, plaque I don't may know not this area, there. but if... If Lake Cal or Lake Harriet is a clock, what time is it? Um, okay, uh, so uh, it yeah, this would be. Well, it, it, it's a, where where Queen meets uh, Linden Hills Boulevard. Yes, but so I'm a St. Paul person. About, about seven o'clock or something. If you're you know if the north okay, is up thank well. you. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say about that? So there is a plaque, and it's. The plaque is below the uh, streetcar station on the lake side of it. That's what I was yeah, showing. Yeah, that, and that that um, there's somewhat suspicious about placing that that uh, plaque. So, anyway. so it's been moving around. Well, th th this is this is evidence that we we found that makes that look like that was sort of just assumed to be the place, but none of the people involved in choosing that place uh, were contemporaries of... No when, historians, okay. When, yeah, when they were, <laughs> no, they were, weren't actually there when the mission was. I whereas see. Whereas the people that are talking about the other place were there when the mission was there. So. If somebody could beep that to me, I'd appreciate it because I would we've, correct we've this got, just in yeah, case we've I'm got never that. going to use this yeah, again. We're working on that for the new... Right, yeah. New it, it, it appeared in the newspaper like you know, so it's, you know, with a more legitimate source, you know, so. Must be true. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I know we're going a little bit long here. Uh, if we had a quick question, otherwise, maybe we should thank everybody for their time. And I thank you for speaker. your patience. I can't believe you sat through all this. You are just yeah. great, and I'm just thrilled with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming.